Penguin called himself the aviator. This guy flew for the, the uh, Ethiopian Air Force when Italy invaded Italy as a combat pilot. Uh, this is an air mail. Here's a black air mail pilot. It, it, the satchel of mail being passed on. And then these are a couple of pilots. I, I have the names elsewhere. I can't remember all of the names. But I just want you to see that there really were a lot of black aviators in this country before World War II. Uh, and this is another another woman aviator from New York. I met her and another woman one in my while I was in my teens in Harlem. Uh, that's the other other woman that I can't get to remember to memorize all these names. Uh, and this is a poem of some sort that someone wrote concerning the business of black aviators. Okay. Now we're ready to go to the meat of, 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 of the sons of I'm discussing Tuskegee Airmen. Before, before 19, before 1940, uh, 45, 40 rather, there were absolutely no black soldiers in the uh, United States Air Force before 1940. The reason being, the War Department, which is now known as the Defense Department, said those guys can't, they can only drive cars, but how do you figure they're going to fly airplanes in combat? And there are, and, and they went so far to say that there are no black aviators. I just got through showing you a whole stack of them there, the whole of that. So. But the present, the, the wars, World War II started in 1939, in the fall of 1939. I remember it was the day after Labor Day, because in New York City, the students were off for a 10 week vacation, and the first day of school was always the day after Labor Day. That's the same day that the German army invaded Poland. I'm not a great, I don't memorize all those things, but I can remember incidents like that. Our first day in school, I remember the teacher saying, the German army invaded Poland. Where the heck is that? Well, there's a country over there next to Germany. The US, in the US, the Congress and the President, President Roosevelt, realized it's just a matter of time before it's gonna hit us. So we better start getting ready. They started a program called it the, the uh, draft. That's the nickname for the, for the uh, program where every 18-year-old boy in, in America, when he reaches 18, they, every boy in America when he reaches 18th birthday had to go to the local post office and sign up for the, this draft so they could be pulled into the army in the event that they were needed, which did happen eventually. So we went three years. We went three years here without being involved in the war at all until the Japanese Navy attacked Pearl Harbor, and that was it. And by that time, I had started high school, the name of the school in New York City was Harry and Avi, Harry and is, a, is a Dutch name, Harry and Aviation High School. When we graduated from there, we were certificated aircraft mechanics. In the full course, the timing was such that by the time they got to me, I graduated, I was on that list too, by 18 years old, I graduated, went downtown to City Hall, to, not to City Hall, but the U.S. Army Recruiting Office, knowing fully well if I didn't do that, I was going to be pulled in just like my cousins and friends were from around the neighborhood. They all ended up in the quartermaster driving trucks, all that cr crappy stuff. You know, <laughs> no one wants to do it. Now, there were black soldiers in the United States ever since the Revolution. You should know, you're right down here in Boston, you should know about this. The very first soldier or fighter that got killed by the British was Crispus Attucks. You know about that? Yep. Probably all you do. You guys are main though. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just, I, I did all this proceed in the regular subject to let you know that there always were black aviators and black soldiers in the United States Army and Navy ever since. But for some reason in World War II, the generals seemed to want to keep all the glory to themselves. That's prejudice. Also, the states where all the training was done, most flight training was done down south, had laws that blacks and whites don't mix, especially married couples. And so that the, 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 the army was really tied down. They couldn't change the rules. And that's why I said, we'll have white fighter squadrons and black fighter squadrons. But not enough blacks were being pulled in to, into the Good, so infantry fight, Air Force, no. So President Roosevelt, by the way, President Roosevelt was president of the United States since I was in kindergarten 
until I joined the army. One president, the only president I ever knew in my whole life. Then he made himself, between himself and the vice president, they decided, okay, we're gonna, this isn't right, we're gonna have to change things, the world is changing, and you know, the president is the, is the leader of all the armed forces in the country. You, when you join the army, you swore, you didn't do anything the president told you to do, right? Right. They were ordered, they were, the army was, thought, the Air Force was part of the army until just recently. They, they, they charged the army to start one fighter group or fighter squadron. One, where all of the, all of the participants would be black men. Up until that point, even in the infantry, wherever they were, the, the, the black units always had colonels and generals in command. Black officers who would only go up as high as maybe colonel just before this time. And the army followed President Roosevelt's uh, instructions, okay, and built an airport in a place called Tuskegee, and that's where that name Tuskegee Airmen, that's where it started. There's a town in, in Southern, there's a town in Alabama named Tuskegee. There's a university there called Tuskegee University. And after they named the airport, after the, after the town, everyone started calling us Tuskegee Airmen. The Army never called us Tuskegee Airmen, never. It, just recently they, they started to do so. But the Army doesn't uh, uh, name soldiers uh, uh, by, based on where they were trained. But we did mostly because of the press. There was a big thing, Tuskegee Airmen. You, you flew in Tuskegee, now you're Tuskegee Airmen. And now, everyone accepts that term, and I'm a Tuskegee Airmen myself. I started in 1940. 1942, I was sent down to this place where I went to. I didn't have to go through the complete mechanics course. The mechanics course in the Army was eight months. It took eight, takes eight, eight months to train an aviation maintenance technician. But I had certificates from my high school, and I didn't have to go to any schools. They sent me straight into an active fighter squadron, right off the street, brand new uniform, and he pointed the Curtis P-40 fighter, which was a famous fighter in World War II, you saw him in the Flying Tigers, and they said, Acting Sergeant Shepard, that's your airplane. You're going to have to take care of that. What are you talking about? You said you were a mechanic, right? Yeah, dude. Well, okay, that's your plane. And, and we, we're going to assign you a white supervisor. And I remember the guy's name, Torgerson. See, I can remember Torgerson's name. That's why he came all the way back. And Torgerson was my instructor. And he instructed a few other uh, mechanics also who didn't have much experience. And he walked around with a sheet like this every day behind me. And I said, good, bad, or indifferent, everything that I did, he'd mark off, mark off, until I was accepted, maybe after uh, three or four months of that. But he said, they, they saved a fortune. They saved a fortune on me because they didn't have to send me to, for training away from the base. And I, I, was, I was assigned to an active fighter squadron that was preparing to go overseas in combat. And I had the title of active corporal. And I learned the ropes six months later. All those six months later, all the guys who they sent away to train came back, had enough pilots and mechanics to make up three squadrons. A fighter squadron in those days had 300 troops. Out of that, 50 were pilots and maybe 75 were mechanics. And all the rest were typewriters and typers, rather, clerks, they called them. Cooks, you name them. But fighter squadrons is uh, integral by itself, because as long as you fed them ammunition, food, and clothing, they didn't need any assistance from any other units. That's the way it used to be. Now, it's all different. Okay, 